You've tuned in to the most crazy rocking metal podcast on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Metal from the Inside. Welcome back to another episode of the Metal from the Inside podcast, and this is a very special episode because I have a fellow rock and metal DJ, yes, the metal ambassador, Mr. Jose Mangan, joining me on this week's episode. And uh, if you are a serious XM listener or just are alive in the rock world, uh, you know Jose from Liquid Metal and Octane. And aside from his DJ work, he also works with Affliction and has hosted every metal event that you could possibly even think of. So thank you so much, Jose, for joining me this week. I appreciate it. Oh, that's awesome, Sydney. And I love uh, being on your show and I love meeting uh, new fellow metal ambassadors you know and i love that you're you're out there preaching a the good gospel of this music and i love that so thank you very much for inviting me on absolutely i uh i love metal man so i mean that's that's one thing i want to get right into with you is that i've always you know in listening to your work and, and seeing everything that you've done it's so evident your passion for the music like first and foremost and i know that you get that a lot but you know it's just the love that you have for this is so evident in everything that you do you know nothing that you do comes off as like he's just doing it for you know money or a name or anything you know it's it's really authentic so i kind of want to just just get into the beginnings of you know your journey into you know being a dj and kind of how you got here um i know that it kind of started if i'm correct uh with motley crew for you right yes motley crew shout at the devil i was in kindergarten wow. when i got uh my grandmother my nana gave me 20 bucks and took my my dad took me to kmart the day after christmas and i bought shout at the devil my cousins who were long-haired uh black shirt wearing uh, black light posters in the gr- in the garage in the back shed uh, chick chicks and band posters and I was like what is this as a little kid right. that was the biggest influence for me because my parents weren't really music listeners or lovers it wasn't that I got it from them my dad was much older too my dad was 49 when I was born so you know he was in his 50s when I was getting my first tape and um, my cousins were who I looked up to. And that was it. I got Motley Crue, shout out to Devil in kindergarten. A week later, I went back to Kmart and I got Out of the Cellar by Rat. Oh. And uh, I love, I love both those albums to this day. I, I love so much, but that's what, that was it. That, and I, 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 I marinated in that sauce for a while, Sydney. And uh, as a little kid, that's, that's, that became everything for me. I used to put my name, Jose, and then put a pentagram in between my name and my last name, Mangan, on, on little, you know, first grade papers, kindergarten papers. I didn't know it was a satanic symbol. I just thought it was Motley Crue, right. you know? Yeah, it, there's no harm in that. But yeah, that's, that's it. And my parents, you know, for years, I think they thought it was going to be a phase. I would grow out of it. Uh, I got in a lot of trouble in going to Catholic school and being such a huge hyper metalhead. Um, that was it. I mean, that that's the one thing that that stayed with my life throughout the entire uh, my 44 years on Earth. That's the that's the one thing that stayed with me. You know, it, it's it's been heavy metal music, and for so long I was just um, a massive fan, worshiping these dudes, um, playing in bands, guitar, bass. Um, covering Sepultura and Testament and stuff like that and Metallica and Pantera and then um, just introducing my friends to the music you know even in high school and then when I got to college is when I started at college radio and that was when I was a freshman and that was a whole other thing I never even thought about being a DJ I just I'm, I was just a deliverer of metal but I never considered myself a DJ. And then I, I got, I started at the college radio station in Tucson and, and then I became the first metal director at the station. And it just felt good be, getting uh, packages in the mail with my name on it and getting the new Napalm Death or the new Corn album or whatever at the time and just opening up these packages and being like, whoa, I got this before it's even out. Like I couldn't <laughs> even believe it. and. Uh, you know, I started 97 um, when I went, 95 when I went to college, sorry. Um, and that's when it started for me. So that was, was huge. And 
for the first time when I walked into the radio station, I really felt like uh, I belonged there or, or welcomed because of how obsessive they were about the music. There was posters uh, on the ceiling, posters covering the walls, stickers all over the desks, the trash cans, you know, everywhere. There was just, it was covered in different bands, not just rock bands, bands I didn't even know who they were, but I saw a corn poster, I saw a Rage Against the Machine poster, and I was like, this, this is a cool spot to be. And, and that was it, and I just did that for years because I loved it. Not because I was making money or getting famous from it or any, I just loved it. I love serving the community uh, by serving metal and, and helping the, the local promoter promote concerts and go to these shows and interview these bands. Even though it was a tiny ass little radio station, I, I still was doing something. And right. it, never, it, was, it wasn't, never crossed my mind, oh, this is gonna be a career option. It was always like, oh, this is what I get to do for fun. because. Sydney, I went to school to be a pharmacist. I'm a chemistry major. So uh, the reason I went to University of Arizona, it has, I got a full ride academic scholarship, but it also has an excellent pharmacy school and a science program. You know, it's, it's a nerdy school in Arizona. <laughs> and um, ASU was more of the party school. U of A was more for nerds. And I've, I've, been, a, I've been a nerd, a metal nerd, a nerd in school. And so uh, nerds are cool. And, and so that's what, led me to doing all that stuff but again it was always for fun it was never yeah. like I never had grand plans I, right. I you know like I didn't and I should have thought about it back then but I did it you know no, I didn't I was just, thinking of I had just no idea you're doing stuff I mean you know you you're I had the same kind of um thing that happened to me where I mean you feel like in music I always grew up when I would see you know things about the music industry or you know see watch movies and you know it was always like you had to know somebody to know somebody to know somebody to get even in the realm of working in the music industry and you know yeah I when I was starting to try to figure out how I wanted to get in here you know I didn't think that you know it would be as easy as you know going to school for it or you know getting into a college radio station or something like that so it's sometimes hard to look at that you know, step back and be like, oh, I can actually do this. It's actually feasible, um, you know, especially when you're, you know, just kind of in the middle of it. So I get that. Yeah, I, I just, I'm, I was focusing on chemistry. Right. You know, I had to do my undergraduate stuff to move on to graduate school to be a doctor of pharmacy. Like that's all I thought about. Uh, I mean, not all I thought about, but that was what I, I that's, I had my, my sort of life uh, on, on, you know, written down on schedule, like it was, go I was going for all that stuff. And it wasn't until um, I went to graduate school in Tennessee, when I chose University of Tennessee College of Pharmacy, I applied to three graduate schools, uh, Arizona, Colorado, and Tennessee, and all of them were top 10 pharmacy school programs at the time. And I was like, I can, I can do this. I'm poor, I'm Mexican, and I've got awesome grades, you know, that was really a great thing for me, uh, you know, then was, was that, you know, like I, I right. this is the type of people that, you know, uh, I'm the dudes that, you know, grants were kind of written for, you know, and, and, you know, my type of, that type of person, you know, that's almost there, but I have no, my family was so poor. We had no money. And so I had to do it all by myself, but I went to graduate school in Tennessee. And the reason I chose that school, Sydney, was because it had an awesome FM rock station. Uh, at the WMFS at the time, and it was an active rock station, and it was pretty cool uh, around, you know, 99, 98, when I was looking into this stuff, 99, and I was like, man, you know, that would be kind of a cool place to work, and my, my half-sister uh, worked out there in Tennessee, in Memphis, and her, her and her husband worked at St. Jude's, so I'm like, you know, the, the, they I have an in with them too you know like that's pretty powerful and they're both pharmacists so I was like you know that would be kind of I've never thought about Memphis you know but let me go to Memphis <laughs> and then I went to Memphis and I remember I got there and as soon as I got there um, I tried getting you know, my contacts from college radio and I was like hey man can you reach out to the program director of, of MFS and see if I can you know talk to him get an interview yeah you know we told we, we told him about you but you know he doesn't really need anybody right now and so I was like ah so I, he was also a DJ in the afternoons 
and the program director. And okay. in between my pharmacy classes, I would call, I would use the courtesy phone in the middle of the, the hallways for our pharmacy school. Cause cell phones weren't really around back then. I didn't have one at that time. And so this is 98 in Memphis. And so uh, I remember calling him, you know, at least once a week or so, I would call him and be like, hey man, it's Jose. You know, I'd love to come in and meet with you. And he'd be like, dude, I don't have time. It's the holidays blank. Uh, you know, hey, well, call me after the next holiday blank. You know, and I would keep trying. And then finally he said, oh, come on in. Okay, I'll meet, I'll meet with you. And then I went in, I said, hey, I would love to do a metal show. And he was like, no way. You know, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not a metal station, right. dude. And I was like, oh, but you know, I'm this metal guy. And he's like, so, you know, but then he, they gave me a job in the promotions department because they were like, all right, this dude's, you know, excited, hungry, let's see. And so, and then I got a job uh, overnights, uh, doing overnights. I filled in one night and then uh, for an overnight a slot on the weekends and they loved what they heard. They said, oh, let's do it again. Next time we need a fill in. So I became a fill-in on, on FM radio in the overnights for the weekends while still going to pharmacy school. And then eventually, a few months in, I, got, I started a metal show there in Memphis on Saturday nights at midnight. It was called Beyond the Pit, and which was the same name on my college radio show. Yeah, it's such a cool name. And um, I did that. And after like a year of doing that and reporting to the trade magazines and, you know, continuing to, to push metal uh, outside of the college radio show, this was a, a bigger platform, you know, and uh, I was serving the tri-state area. So I, uh, we hit people in Mississippi, Arkansas and Tennessee. And there was a lot of metalheads there. The show became pretty popular. Uh, and then I won an award for best metal director and DJ in Album Network, which was a trade magazine back in the day. And so people in the industry saw my picture, saw my little you know, story, yeah. and they were like, this dude's cool. And they knew me from, the, from already, from college radio. So this dude's cool. So then I started getting job offers to work in the business. Uh, but, I, but I'm like, wait a minute. I, I, I have three years left of pharmacy school to be a doctor. You know, I've been pursuing this for so long. Like, I don't yeah. know. And then TVT Records flew me out to New York City, and it was my first time going out to Manhattan. I was, wow, blown away. I, I couldn't even believe it. I'm from the border of Arizona and Mexico, a tiny little town. So to be in New York City, I was amazed by it. And I, obviously, I fell in love like anybody does uh, and, and would when you go to New York City is, uh, with an opportunity to maybe work at this record label. And so uh, I went there, I interviewed, and I was like, this is really cool. And then I talked to my dad and my dad and I were, he pushed education on me just because that's all he really, he was a very smart man. He didn't play baseball or football with me. I mean, he taught me how to write essays. You know, he taught me state capitals. He taught me how to just to speak and write and, and, and stand out on paper and how important that was and still is to this day. But, um, and I talked to my dad and I said, hey, dad, I have this opportunity to, to go to New York City to work in the, in the rock business. And, and he was like, I thought he was going to say like, no, you're crazy, Jose. You're, you're almost a doctor. Like, don't, don't do this. You've worked so hard. You've spent so much money and time and effort on this. And then he told me, you got to do it. I don't, you can't regret anything like this. What if you regret this forever? And he told me a story that he, he my dad was in the uh, an army and he was in the Korean war, the Korean conflict, and it changed his life. And he joined the army because not because he kind of really, really wanted to, but it was also family pressure. And it was, you know, outside pressure, you know, kind of wanting to do that. And he was like, oh, okay, but he wanted to be an attorney. And he's like, oh, I'll just, I'll do this real quick. And then the Korean conflict happened and then he went off to Korea and then he became disabled and you know messed up from it and then he came back and he was you know I didn't know any of this but then he was just saying that he just regretted every day he regretted that decision and I, I, it hit me so hard and I was like whoa dad you know and he was like you got to do this you know you got to do this and I said boom with my dad saying that to me and I already felt that I was like okay Wow. You know, all this school, all this education led me to this position point in life. Yeah. Like the Led Zeppelin said, 
song, you know, uh, there are two paths you can go by, but, in the, you know, but in the long run, yeah. there's still time to change the road you're on. So uh, I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do this. They're like, oh my God. And it was embarrassing to, with a lot of family and people that I worked with in pharmacy and forever. Like they were like, what, what are you doing? You know? And I'm like, I'm going to go to New York city and work at a rock label and bye, you know, it's like, but <laughs> I did that. And I made that, that very scary decision because life is, is about those type of decisions. And then, and then it's like, choose your own adventure. Those old school books, like you can, you can go one way or you can go this way which goes to these, all these different ways. But I, I, I said, I had to do it. And then a few months after working at TVT, Sydney, I got a, a, a call from Sirius Satellite Radio. But that was, here's how the funny part about that. They didn't call me to, to recruit me. They were calling me because I was the record label guy and they wanted okay. a bunch of uh, albums, CDs to build the alternative channel. Like, so he asked me for all the, we had Guided by Voices and XTC and all these bands that, I don't really like that stuff, you know, but I was more of the metal rock guy, but the alternative stuff was stuff that I worked as well. So this guy uh, called me up and I was like, serious satellite, what? What is that? You know, and, and this was uh, the summer of 2000. I had just started in January of 2000 at TVT. And in the summer I get this call and, and then he tells me what the serious is. And I'm like, man, I don't know. That sounds crazy. You're asking me for 50 albums, dude. Like I got to get approval from the man, my manager. I don't know, man. And he was like, I'll send you some information on the company in the mail. So a couple of days later, I get a pamphlet uh, on the path train from New York city back to Jersey where I lived. And I was reading this pamphlet and it's serious satellite radio. And it explained the, the, the short brief history of it, uh, the, how they raise the money to build these billion dollar satellites, the executives they had from all these different industry companies that were coming to build Sirius, um, the subscription plan. And then I got to the programming guide and I was going through it and I right away, my, my eyeballs went right to rock. And then I was going to metal and I was like, oh my God, is there a metal station? And I said, it sell 24 seven heavy metal. And then that was it. I saw that and I, and, and I knew that I had to fucking work there. I knew that I had to do anything I could to be a part of that new 24 seven metal channel. So then I told the guy who asked me for all this stuff. I was like, yo, I'll give you anything and everything you want. Who is the rock guy? Give me his email. I need to talk to him. So I sent this rock guy at the time a, a big email on how I live shit and breathe metal. He wrote me two sentences back. Like I invited him to a concert to go see one of the bands on our label at Irving Plaza in New York City. Okay. He agreed. To, he agreed to come meet me there. Um, and then he just said he also called me crazy, you know, because my email was probably pretty insane. You know, I mean, I was really pouring it out there. I was I'm not going to when I write shit, I write with purpose. Like I'm not going to just be yeah, a little uh, an e uh, a sentence that doesn't stand out. Like, I'm going to stand out, like, you know, I, I, on paper, on, on camera, on the air, what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand out. And so that's what that email was. We met. He really liked me a lot, inviting me up to the headquarters, which they were just building in, in Times Square. And they had, we still had plastic um, walls uh, where there were going to be glass walls. And I remember memorizing the brochure, right? I'm waiting in the lobby, Sydney, uh, to meet this rock guy. Um, and I'm like looking, I'm 36 floors high. Uh, I'm looking at Radio City Music Hall right down there. I'm like, God, this is, this is crazy. Where am I? What am I doing? And then the head of programming, uh, an Italian lady wa walking down the, the hallway and I see her because I memorized the brochure. I know who she is. So I get up and I'm like, hey, what's up? Hey, Maria. Hey, I'm Jose Mangi. Nice to meet you. And she said, how do you know my name? And who are you? And I said, I, I, I'm here to see, you know, the rock dude. And I, I know you because I memorized the brochure. And she started cracking up. She started talking to me. She was like, what, what, who are you? What are you doing here? And I just, I, I just talked to her. I just said, I'm from the Mexican border. And I went to school to be a pharmacist. And I'm here because I, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I've done metal my whole life. And she's like, do you know Spanish? And I was like, of course. And I started speaking Spanish with her fluently. And she asked me about Latin rock bands. 
And I started naming off all these Latin rock bands because I grew up on the border and I, yeah. I knew so many of them. And then she was like, you are perfect. And two weeks later, I got a job offer to come build the rock department and the Spanish rock department at Sirius Satellite Radio. So I started in September of 2000. So it'll be my 22nd anniversary at the company this September. So there's the long story of how I got here. That is incredible. And you think about it and, you know, it seems like you're talking about, you know, you got all this way of, you know, going to school to become a pharmacist. But when you really think about it, it's like if you hadn't have, if you didn't do that, you wouldn't, it, it all led, you know, to, to here. If you didn't go to graduate, you know, school to, in Tennessee, you know, you wouldn't have ever worked at that station and you wouldn't, it's, it's so crazy. I always find just like the chain reaction of things like that. So incredible. That's amazing. It's so, but it's so important. That's why education is so important. And I think people are forgetting that. The forgetting, it's not just about the degree, you know, or the certificate. It's about the journey yes. of getting there. It's about the people that you're going to meet, you know, uh, future co-workers, uh, wives, husbands, you know, whatever. You're going to meet all these different characters, best friends of your life because of these things that you did. So what I always stress to uh, young kids, uh, college students, high school students, uh, anybody that's in this, in this line of work and wants to do what I do, they always ask me, how do I get to where you are? What did you do? What can I major in to do what you're doing? And it's such a hard question to answer, cause, but it's an easy one. I went to school to be a pharmacist, you know? <laughs> and, then, and then people's reaction is like, what? Huh? No, <laughs> oh, no. And I'm like, yes, I'm an organic chemistry nerd. I used to carry around a periodic table of elements in my wallet, a laminated one, a little mini one. And I remember showing my my at the time she was a, a, a girl that I was you know going out with sort of she became my wife but I, sh I remember showing her my my periodic table and she thought that was the stupidest thing like she was like that's such a nerdy thing that's what are you what are you doing like that's that's not cool and I'm like you're wrong it is cool you know so uh but yeah but I push I push education I yeah. push it to all students of all ages and it's just like how important it is because even if you pursued something, you know, you, you, you'll, get, you'll get that degree if that's what you want and you're pursuing that. But, or you could do other things, but it, you wouldn't know. Like if I, I, from this tiny town, I was such a metalhead. I had long hair and a mustache and a unibrow, you know, and I was super cool. And I was just like, raw. I would have been in a band. You know, I would have, I would have probably been in a band and then uh, be manager of like AutoZone or something, you know, and I, I don't know, but you know, I think it was the, in the high school where I was like, I'm going to use my brain. I'm going to, and we're also my friends and people were getting busted for drugs and it was a real big drug town. We crossed everything over the border. So these were all my friends and and, and fellow classmates and family members getting busted or making money, you know? So it was, it was a really different, crazy time back then. And I just made a, the, the decision to, to use my brain to get out of this place. And it really, it really, it really paid off. Like, I can't even believe it. I'm so blessed, Sydney. I'm so blessed. But I still use all that um, skills from being such a nerd in school and so like I use it for programming. I use it for analyzing data, spins, research, right. you know, uh, what do I want in cattle in my catalog? What do I want in currents? What's the percentage of rotation for, you know, currents versus catalog and how fast, what's the turnover of the songs and programming is very uh, mathematical and, and analytical in a lot of nerdy ways. And, and I love that about it. I love writing all the copy, the production, the, the, the summaries, the descriptions, the send to staff, the send to the social media people, the send to the bands, you know, like all that stuff. You got to be able to write. You got to be able to do all that stuff. And, I, and really, my education, I think, put me in a really awesome position to succeed and uh, to kick ass. And, 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 you know, I'm very blessed to have a, a, a unique position. There is nothing else like it in the world. Nobody has this job. Um, 
and you know, I'm not going anywhere. Like I'm going to, they're going to bury me. And as I'm getting buried, I'll still be doing my show somehow. Um, <laughs> I don't know, uh, from the, from the grave, you know, but I, there's, this is, it's a dream job. And, and I love being able to make people happy and make, you know, and that bands and fans. So it, it's really, really, really kind of crazy. Yeah. And, and something that, you know, listening to you, you know, tell that story and, you know, all of the times that you were my one of my favorite sayings um, that I was told to by a really good friend one time that uh, very early on has never left my brain is, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And I, I have remembered that in every situation, whether it's a job or, you know, getting an interview or, you know, you use that example, you know, so well. And, you you know, you have to be persistent and determined. And, you know, yeah, you got to call or email, you know, the person that, you know, has the ability to, you know, make your dreams come true in a sense. You know, you got to keep pounding on the door. You know, eventually it's going to open. And, you know, like you said, calling the program director and going, hey, do you need anything? Hey, do you need anything? Because eventually they're going to see you're A, authentic. You know, you really want this. It's not, you know, bullshit. And, uh, you know, eventually they're going to be like, man, I, I <laughs> should probably give this person a chance. They're like, you know, banging on the door over and over again. So I think that that's such a great example of that, um, you know, just determination and persistence. I mean, that's that's the big part of the battle. And that's where a lot of people give up. A lot of people just settle and give up and you know, it's hard though. It is hard. Like to jump into this, into this business right now, it is, it's not easy. Yeah. Like there are no jobs for this. You know, I mean, there's, there's the, the internet, which anybody can, you know, now kind of do their own thing. And I think that's such a, a an, an awesome opening that we didn't have that chance before. Like I just couldn't start a cool podcast or a cool video cast back in the day. It wasn't, it wasn't as, as, as cool and as easy it is, but I love how there's so many people that are getting into this and helping to spread the music, helping to talk about this in more formats and in other ways, uh, you know, getting their circle of friends and family to, to hear these shows and to watch these shows. It all goes to helping the music community. And so, but again, you know, doing stuff out of purity not because you're trying to make a buck even at the beginning of Sirius like it was never about money either I, I still say it to this day to, to the company and probably I shouldn't say it publicly but I do I would pay Sirius XM to work there I would pay them to let me do my shows that's how much I love it I can't believe that I get paid to do this stuff you know after all these years but that's how I feel like I feel like it's, it's so second nature to me um, to be on the air every day and to get us through these crazy ass times, you know, when the last two years have been pretty nuts and I've been on the radio every single day, except for weekends, thankfully. Um, <laughs> God, uh, but oh it's, it's been, it's rough. Imagine Sydney sitting here. I have a, a TV here uh, in front of me and I'm, I'm, I have a bunch of cool, set, my, my computers and everything, my screens, but like, you know, when st real world stuff is happening and you're on the radio at, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon and there's real crazy stuff happening that's big, you know, like, you know, just everything, all the bad stuff that's been happening too, you know, I just try to keep reminding our listeners, United is going to be the way we get through this shit because I could have chose the path of a divider, but I chose a long time ago to be a uniter to bring us together and that's what's been so satisfying for me is being able to be a consistent voice of of, of positivity and of warmth um and being authentic on the radio every day through these crazy times together and trying to help us you know i mean the pandemic was crazy you know people didn't work for a long time we didn't skip a beat it became crazier for us busier then all of a sudden, you know, we're doing Zoom interviews every day. And before we had to wait for an artist to come to one of our studios to do stuff. And now it's like, oh, we can just do it right now. Like, oh, we, oh, you know. And, and so it just became so easy. So it became crazier with work. You know, but, 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 we, but being there and being with, with, with you and, and all the listeners, it's been really, really cool. So it, so become, it becomes, we're trying to say it becomes personal. Yeah. It's personal. All this stuff is very personal. I'm very personal on the radio 
You know, I don't, I don't, the way I talk right now and the way I talk on the radio is the way I talk in real life yeah. and the way I talk to my friends and the way I get excited to show somebody, you know, in my truck, check out this new song. Like it's the same way that I would do on the radio, but that's what makes it so easy where I don't have to think about it. You know, a lot of times presenters, hosts think that they have to find a character or, or play a role. You know, I've, I've, I've trained and hired uh, most of the DJs on our rock platform at Sirius XM. And sometimes it's been tough. People think, oh, well, I need to be this person. It's like, well, well, no, just can't. why don't you just be yourself? Like I had one a DJ and he, we, we had an air check and we were, you know, he was kind of sounding like he was being robotic or not sounding very natural on the radio. Right. And then he was telling me the story outside on the, on the sidewalk on 49th street, we were walking to the train and then he was like, Oh man, I just went to this show. Oh, this this had this happened, this happened. And then I was like, dude, why can't you just talk like that on the radio? Just talk to me, talk to one person. Like just what you just did. That's, that's a break, right? That's a radio break. You know, when you're on a microphone and you put your headphones on, all of a sudden you're, you change your voice and you, uh, you're, and then, you know, do all this stuff. Like, why? Stop. Just talk. Be yourself. Be authentic. That's the thing that I would tell anybody that wants to be a host. Just be you. Right? Be you. If you have to be a character, then you always have to think about that character. And then you can't be yourself. Then you're not that character. Sometimes it's okay to be yourself. I mean, I mean, always okay to be yourself. But sometimes it's okay to, to say stuff like, man, like uh, my teeth hurt, you know, or be real. Mess up on the radio. You know, if you mess up a word, start over, start, start, you know, start again and keep, keep going. Like you trip, get up and keep finishing. You know, because that's, that's really cool. I love, I mess up all the time. I say the wrong shit. I mess up all the time, but it's, I'm, I'm on the radio 12 hours a day. I mean, I, yeah. I'm going to mess up a lot. It's the great thing about it. It's, it's the, like, it's the aspect, like you said, it's, it is so personal. Like, you know, it's somebody's in their car or doing something, you know, listening while they're at work, you know, it's when you're listening, you think that whoever's on the radio is talking specifically to you, which is, I mean, it's how it should be. And it's something that, like you just said, you know, when you're behind the microphone, you know, just pretend you're talking to a friend, you know, that it's because you are, I mean, essentially these people are tuning in and like you were saying about kind of the one thing that unites us, you know, like we're listening to the station and either I'm DJing or somebody's listening or somebody's tuning in in their car. And, you know, we're all here for the the same thing that we all love. I feel like sometimes it does get, you know, in your head to, you know, realize, okay, I'm I'm like live and there are people listening. And if I screw up, I think I screwed up, you know, 10 times more than people actually realize I screwed up. And it's like, yeah, I mean, you're, you're live though. Like people are, you know, gonna, nobody's perfect. You know, when you're talking in a situation, you're not like, yeah, like you said, like, oh, I am, you know, this and this and that and doing this. And, you know, like, it's just not, it's not real. And I feel like people don't gravitate towards things that are, you know, not authentic, at least in this community of like, you know, rock. And it's and just... you can tell the fake ones from the real ones, especially yeah. in this music. I mean, really, especially in this music. I know people that don't even go to shows and don't even, they don't even <laughs> and it's like, how can you be a rock DJ? No, no. like that's rule number one. Go yeah. to rock shows, go to festivals, hang out with, you know, everyone and, and, and really experience what the, what the, the lifestyle, the community, what it's about. And that's so important to, uh, to give back and to realize that. And, and that's where I, I think I've been blessed um, that, you know, I've, I've always been just the same. And so I think people that hear me uh, for the first time and like, oh, this guy, you know, I don't know. Some people, I, he's annoying. I hate him. Every word he says, I hate his voice. And then after years, it's like, oh, well, damn it he at least he's consistent you know he's he's the he's the same stoner tequila drinking metalhead positive guy like okay damn it's hard to that you know to find things to hate you know so i'm just gonna keep killing everyone with kindness and keep being a unifier and i i think it's it's it works but it's long term and it works you know, if I wanted to be a negative dude, I'd have more followers. I'd, I'd be, you know, more people would be like, oh, what's he going to say next and stuff. But if you're just always positive, like, oh, you know, 
yeah, he's Jose. It's Jose. He's positive. Okay, next. Like, oh, oh, this person's talking this and saying this. It's like, I'm gonna, I'm here for the long haul, yeah. and I'm just gonna do this uh, consistently and and be really loving to the bands, to the fans, and to always like, like you mentioned too. Always talk to one person. It's the best thing that you can do as a host and as a presenter. That's like secret sauce right there for DJs because a lot of professional big DJs, you will hear them and they're talking, they're saying, oh, you guys, uh, every one of you, the all you this. Guys. And it's like, oh. <laughs> stop, no, dude, you're talking to one person, yeah. one person. And I hear veteran broadcasters mess that up all the time. So it might, you know, it's always easier and more personal to talk to one person. And then they feel it, like you just said, they feel that on the other end because that person's talking to me. And then they've seen my family being raised. They've seen my daughters go from embryos to, you know, 18 year old chicks, you know? So it's like people have an investment, you know, as well with, with Sirius XM. And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a personal investment. And when, when I meet people, they're like, oh my God, and they're so loving and friendly and, they say all these things and remember all these things that I say. I'm like, wow. And how are your daughters? And oh, that was so great that she's singing now. And that this girl is doing this. It's like, wow. Like people really, really pay attention, but that's, uh, that's our community, man. It's a small, very passionate, you know, tight knit community. And I love being a leader in that world. No, it's, it's really cool. It's, uh, you know, like I said, everything that you, you do and, you know, you say, it just, it all comes off really authentic. So um, I think that definitely, it definitely shines through. But um, one thing that I, I wanted to just ask to see, I feel like every DJ, and I know we kind of talked about it briefly, you know, and just now about, you know, sometimes you screw up. I feel like every DJ has had times and specific memories and, you know, their, their heads, whether they accidentally had dead air or they said something completely wrong, or they thought they had dead air and they didn't. You know, like, do you have any story that comes to your mind exactly that you're like, I fucked up? <laughs> yes, I have the ultimate fuck up story. And I, oh, it was so big. Okay. It was System of a Down. And it was the entire band. And they never do entire band interviews. Not never, but they hardly Apparently, ever yeah. did it. At that time, and and even now, and it was around hypnotized, mesmerized. Around that time, they were just the biggest band in the world. Um, we convinced them, management convinced them that it'd be a good idea for all of them to come up. So they all did, and we all got into the main studio right off the lobby in New York City, and I was running it. And the guys all came in. We were, you know, everyone was saying what's up, and then. Uh, I got behind the microphone, you know, behind the main uh, area, and uh, and we just kind of started the interview, and like uh, quickly, cause it was just so. I was like, oh, you know, boom, and I jumped right into it, and we started talking, and afterwards, everybody, I, I closed it out, and everybody was like, yes, like high fiving each other, uh, the band members, management, record label. Everybody was like, oh, my God, that was the coolest all band interview that we've done. And people were like just freaking out. And then I, and then, you know, giving me praise. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, like, yeah. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, guys, guys, wait, before you guys go, because they were getting up and taking their headphones off. Uh, and everyone was amped up. And I was like, wait, 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 I need some IDs. Because uh, usually I would get IDs yes. in the beginning. Yeah. Um, just to get it out of the way. But I did it because we started so fast. So then they were like, all right, all right. So they put their uh, you know, headphones on. They came back to the microphone. I turned around and I was going to hit like uh, pause and then go to the next track to go to track two would be like the IDs. Zero, 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 zero across my CD. I didn't fucking record it. I didn't do a backup. I didn't record it into the system. I didn't do anything. And it was almost an hour. Okay, so then the last person out of the studio was a, a record, the record label guy, the head of rock for a major label. Everybody's in the lobby. I see them still high-fiving, you know, hugging each other. I go, hey, dude, hey, dude, hey, dude, come here the, to the record label guy. I didn't want to say who his name was. And then I said, hey, dude, um, I got to tell you something. I, 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 I didn't hit record. And then he said, what? 
I said, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't record it, dude. And I was, I was, I was panicky. Yeah. And he was like, don't fucking say a word. Don't tell the band. Don't say anything. And then he walked out of the fucking studio and I stood there by myself like, so I went out to the lobby to say goodbye. And I, I just, I couldn't even, I couldn't even like my, my whole demeanor, you know, but they left pretty quickly. I went outside and I cried. I cried. It was the first time that something at work just crushed me so hard. And I didn't record it. And besides like my work, you know, the band, like it just, it was like a big epic fail on all parts. And all I got was a fucking ID at the very end. So, so then I went to Ozfest that weekend in Connecticut and I saw the guys backstage and I said, you know, hello to them. And uh, they were being so cool to me. And then I, I, I told them, I was like, Hey, I, I didn't record it all four backstage before their headline Ozfest uh, set. And they all put their heads down. They walked away from me. They weren't, cool they didn't say anything to be like oh it'll be okay you know like oh nothing they all walked away like disgusted and i just was like again i was gonna fucking cry right there i was like oh my god oh my god and then i just sat there stood there and i didn't know what to say i, I should have just I was, i'll just leave now and then shavo bass player came up to me and he was like hey dude put his arm around me and he was like hey i, ha I have monday off uh, I'm gonna, I was going to come back to New York with my family and friends and, and my girl. We were going to go to Manhattan and, you know, like, uh, this was in Connecticut. I was in Connecticut at Ozfest. And then he was like, I'll come up and, and then I'll do, I'll do the interview, but it'll just be me. And I said, dude, Shavo, thank you. So Shavo came up on Monday afternoon with like an entourage of like eight people. And he got into one of our other studios. And as before we even started, he pulled out this giant pipe and he started smoking weed in our studio. You can't do that in New York city. Like in our, no. it, it, it's, <laughs> it's strict. Like you can't do that. Yeah. But I was, and then I was like, yo, Shavo, dude. Uh, like, Oh, uh, I don't think you can smoke dad right here. And he was like, bro, you fucked up. I'm here on my day off. I'm going to fucking smoke weed right here. You could, what do you want? What are you going to do? And then, and I was like, all right, well, let me have some. <laughs> I mean, if we're gonna do it, right? Let's just let's do it together. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm not get fired right now. I'm gonna go out in a blaze of glory, man. So let's oh, go. Oh my gosh. And so, uh, but we did it, and it was safe. I wasn't fired. Nobody found out. We did a cool, fun interview. He gave me shit the entire time. You know, we did an intro where he so where he said, "You fuck up, bro." <laughs> and so he made fun of me the entire time. But it was a really cool interview, and. Uh, and, and since then, Shavo and I have been really good friends. You know, he's been so sweet. I've loved smoking weed with him over the years. He has a great new cannabis company, 22 Red. And um, we've been really cool to each other. And I can't wait to see him. I hope maybe uh, next week I'm going to go to the Corn System of a Down show. So, uh, but yeah, so that was my biggest of all time mess up ever. Uh, yeah, so on, on air, nothing really that 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 big of a deal i mess up so much i don't even catalog them anymore but yeah. that system of a down one was and i haven't recorded band interviews a few times after that on accident but they they were with whatever bands like we were doing them favors like it yeah. wasn't like we really wanted system this band. i was like oh <laughs> i'll do the interview sure and then i forgot to hit record it afterwards i was like oh well don't got it <laughs> moving on next so uh, so that's happened before, but yeah, that system one was a real big, big mess up, but you know, uh, did I learn from my mistakes? I mean, yeah, kind of, but like I just told you, I've messed up since then. So it's hard though. Like when, you know, you're the person that's, you know, you're behind the board and, and, and you're responsible to make, to make sure that everything technically goes right while you're trying to entertain a group of four people and keep a conversation moving and like, it's a lot. Like, I feel like sometimes people don't understand what really goes into that, you know, especially it's a little different in a situation like this where all I had to do is press record on Zoom and it's taken care of it for me. But, you know, you're on the air and you're 
operating the board and making sure, you know, everything's going. It, it's an in-depth, so I don't blame you at all for that. I mean, shit happens, you know? And, you know, sitting to this day, I still get nervous before all of my interviews, before any stage introduction, before, not before I'm on the radio, but when I'm doing, yeah, I, I do get uh, you know, the, the, the same nerves, but I think that's good. Yes. You know, it kind it kind of keep it keeps me on my toes. I mean, it means that you can't like I I've gotten this a lot too. I mean, before I do an interview and even like starting like I said this whole DJ thing on like FM. I did college and now I'm into this thing. And so I mean, the first couple times I've I've been getting better because I've been filling in a bit. But I mean, it's still nerve wracking sometimes. But you know, I've had conversations with people and it's like it means that you care. You know, you're not. You're not just getting on and, and doing it and being like, ah, who gives a fuck? You know, if it happens, whatever happens, happens. I mean, it's, you know, you want it to go well. You want it to be successful, you know, whatever content you're making or saying or, you know, so I, I think that it's a good thing, you know, and I'm, I'm impressed that after all, you know, this time, I mean, 21 years, almost 22 years of working there. You know, you still get nervous. I'm sure you still get nervous, you know, before you talk to people like Metallica and like, you know, a lot of the bands that you grew up loving and you're like still probably like, holy shit, I get to to talk to these people. So, yeah, I, I mean, I'm comfortable with everyone except James Hetfield. <laughs> um, yeah, from Metallica. And he's such a teddy bear to me and he loves me and I love him way, 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 way more. But it's, I still get nervous. They're, they're, they're Metallica and Pantera are my two favorite bands. And um, Robert is super close and Kirk and I are super close. Uh, Lars, you know, I'm very comfortable with Lars. I'm not nervous around him. For some reason, I feel like, because I've done so much stuff with him over the years and yeah. I, I've done a lot with James. I've been very, very lucky to be given access to James because he, 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 he's a big fan of what I'm doing with Liquid Metal and um, he's listening, he's been listening uh, to Sirius XM for, for a long time. In Rolling Stone magazine back in 2008, James Hetfield name checked me in an in a interview where he was, he asked someone, the reporter uh, interviewer asked him, what are you listening to nowadays, James? Just very open-ended. And the first thing that he said was there's a station on Sirius called Heart Attack. This is back in the day. Um, and there's a DJ named Jose He's like a freaking firecracker of energy and passion or something else. I, I almost have it memorized, but I, I couldn't believe that my idol, I, don't, I didn't even know him at that time. I met him in person after that, but to, for him to, to say that, it's like- I, I, Out of the blue? Oh my God. <laughs> I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. So he has asked me to help pick bands for the, his Orion Fest that they did. Um, he's- uh, taking selfies on his phone with me um, for him, you know, like that, that blows my, cause I'm always, I'm the one that'd be like, Hey, dude, let's yeah. do a quick picture, you know? But, but one time he was like, Hey, Jose, let's do a picture. I was like, on, on your phone? <laughs> <laughs> I you mean this is going to be in your camera roll? Like, this is crazy. <laughs> so, and he emailed me that picture too. So, I mean, yeah, I still buckle at the knees when I talk to James. I just did a big interview with him uh, in regards to the 30th anniversary of the Black Album. And that was uh, last September. And I remember uh, the interview was supposed to be after the Howard Stern Metallica performance. And that went on a lot longer. And then we waited. So my interview time was at one time, it was an hour later. Ooh. So, but I was on a Zoom session in an LA studio. I was at my house and, and he was in our, so I, I was just talking to the engineer, uh, but we were just waiting because any minute James could have walked in. Right. So imagine Sydney waiting an hour like, like this to interview James. And I'm just like, <laughs> any second now could happen. Any second now, could happen. it's like you know. Okay, okay, not yet. I, on my notes, and I'm like, <laughs> oh my god. And then my armpits, and then my ass crack, and everything. My hands, everything starts to get super wet and sweaty, and I can't. It, I I freak out. Um, and it's yeah. That was such. That was probably my most panic interview. Was waiting an hour to talk to James Hetfield. Like th that was torture. It was, I, I couldn't imagine. handle it. I couldn't, I couldn't take it. My, my heart was beating so fast that I had to do breathing exercises. I swear, Sydney, yeah. 
because I was freaking out. And then I heard his voice in the background. And then he was like, oh. And then my friend was like, oh, no, he's just going to go outside and smoke a cigarette. I was like, oh, my God. He's, so he's almost, he's almost here. You know, like, oh, my God. I just gave him a big hug. In December, last month, uh, I was at the 40th anniversary shows yeah. in the Bay Area. And I, was, I hosted a concert that features James's son, Lars's two kids, and Robert's son. And the three bands played together in between the Metallica shows uh, on Saturday night. And I hosted this, this performance. And uh, the dads were there. And, you know, that, back, that little room was cut off to everyone. They had the COVID dogs there. That was the first time that I ran into a COVID dog. And then weeks later, it was a story on the metal news sites that Metallica hired COVID dogs. And I got sniffed by one of those COVID dogs to get into this uh, friends and family area upstairs and then to go back to their their little room at this old church where they were playing at. Like I I was, so I was talking to Robert uh, and I was, oh yeah, 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 yeah. And all of a sudden, like I have my mask on, you know, and all of a sudden, everybody does. And all of a sudden, I just, I can, I sense an energy right, like right behind me and I can smell a cigarette. And then I turned around and it was James. James, isn't it? <laughs> oh, and he has this big wool coat on and, and he's got boots. He looks so cool. He has his big mask on too. And then I looked, I was like, oh. I was like, hey, James. And then I was about to say, it's me. But he knew and he just opened his arms and he gave me a big hug. And I was like, oh, oh, oh my God. James. Yeah. And I was able to hug Lars. Robert is so close. We're, we're so close. But I gave three hugs to Metallica uh, that night. And uh, I was very, that, like, that stuff is what I do all this shit for, is to give hugs to Metallica. Like, then that's it. That's my... <laughs> That's my prize. That's, that's my award. Yeah. That's the thing that I get like the, for being here and doing this shit so long is, is stuff like that. Yeah. I, I, I can hug James. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. The, the biggest interview I've done so far um, was I had Alice Cooper on who is like my, uh, he is my absolute, he is my Metallica. He is my James Hetfield. I, I love Alice. Um, and so I had him on the podcast and, you know, I'm like, I'm in my, yeah, like, my bedroom, because this, this was, like, you know, still, like, you know, COVID, and, like, there was no, you know, no studio, nowhere I could go, and so, you know, I'm, like, in my bedroom, and I got, like, my vinyl behind me, and, you know, I didn't have to wait an hour, though, that, thank God I didn't have to wait an hour, but I didn't even having him on, I mean, like, I've, I've had the opportunity to meet him a bunch of times, and I'm really familiar with his band, and Nita, and, you know, I know them all well, you know, just, they've known me since I was like 15. And so I'm still though, no matter how many times I see him or talk to him or, you know, whatever, I'm still completely just like shell shocked. I'm like, I can't, like, I can't believe you're talking to me. I, uh, there was one time where I, um, went to, uh, think a Hollywood vampire show and I got to see him afterwards and, uh, you know, I start talking to him and he's like, you know, yeah, Sydney, like I know who you are. And he starts telling Johnny Depp about me. And I'm like, huh? Like, this is, this is crazy. So like, even though like that stuff like that has happened and, you know, having him on the podcast and like, it doesn't matter. It's still whenever I'm in the vicinity, you know, of him or like talking to him, I'm, I'm still like, just my mind is blown. So I, I totally, uh, totally get that feeling. It's incredible. I love Alice Cooper. Uh, he has been such a great representative for my home state, Arizona, yeah. where uh, he's done so much for the communities there. And I, I love, love, love Alice Cooper so much. He, such a sweetheart. Yeah, he's uh, he's the best. He is the absolute best. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I wanted to talk to you really quick, too, about because um, I found it so interesting. You, you mentioned Pantera. I love Pantera as well. And I know that, you know. You were, of course, friends with Vinny and, you know, have a long kind of history with those guys. Um, and I saw it was a little bit over a year ago, I think. It's been a little bit, but you had inherited his limo. And it was this whole kind of journey of getting it renovated and a GoFundMe was set up and you raised $50,000. And I was looking at it and people are still donating to it, you know, months and months, months later. So first, give me a little insight onto how you obtained the limo because that's crazy just hearing you say those words and 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 that intro it 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 still blows my mind and i cannot believe that 
They're my absolute favorite band. And I can't believe that I have this prize of theirs, which they loved. They called it the White Fang. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, oh my God. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, Pantera is my favorite band. My first tattoo was Pantera, uh, my necklace. I got Pantera tattoos on my hand, on my legs still. Uh, our dog is named Rocky Dimebag. Um, I became very close with Vinny, you know, after the death of his brother uh, and just was there for Vinny and, and his dad. And um, I did so much for them, you know, just as a fan, as a programmer, as a host, just lo always loving. And then I became, you know, fortunate to be very close with them when they started Hell Yeah. Uh, Tom Maxwell is a, is a longtime friend of mine from the band Nothing Face. So they were a big, big band in my life. And he joined up with Vinnie Paul. I've known Chad since, you know, the beginning, the Mudvayne days. So I was like, oh, wow. And so they really, you know, came to me and said, hey, Jose, we need you and, and your support. I was like, oh, my God, of course. So I just went above and beyond, you know, for, for them and for Vinny and over the years did just everything with them. Um, everything, partying, hanging out at his house, doing specials with him at, anywhere and everywhere, hosting his book release uh photo book release parties in new york city like i mean i'm just anything they would ask me to do i hosted every dime bash every ride for dime almost i uh, everything that was pantera dime bag related you know that i was there and mostly and so it, but I, it wasn't it, i never made a penny any any money from that it was all volunteer stuff like i hosted all these years and years and years of things just to to host it not for anything else but that so I think my years and years and years of, of devotion and dedication really paid off in a, in a supernatural way. But when Vinny passed, it was very, very, very traumatic for, for, for so many of us. And um, I went to his funeral and I was there by myself, super high uh, in the beginning, in the lobby, just kind of seeing all the people that were coming in and just like, really like, what, where am I? What is happening right now? Yeah. And then Pantera's publicist came over to me and she grabbed my hand and she started walking with me and she said, Hey, we need you to speak. And I said, Oh, you mean at the public memorial this Sunday, which was tomorrow. And, and she, and they were, and she was like, no, now we want you to, to speak here at his, at his services and for the private services. And I was like, are you kidding? In front of every, what now? Like, why didn't you tell me? Like, oh my God, like I start panicking. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? Right now? She was like, yes, but we, we, we trust that you can just do it. Just, just, just wing it. And I was like, what? So then I, Sydney, this is crazy. Open casket. I, it's, there's only like four speakers. Ace Freely from Kiss is one of them. And, and, and me. I, I'm just a fan. I'm, I'm not anybody. I'm a huge fan and to be waiting to go up to talk at the podium in front of family and friends and Chelsea and bride dog and I was like oh my god so I went up there and I delivered a very from the heart um, words um, for maybe 10 minutes I don't even know how long I spoke but I made everybody laugh um, one, a, a real loud roar. I want to share this quick little story. Yeah. This is, um, and then I'll get to the limo part, but this is fun. Uh, I was talking directly to Jerry, Vinny and Dime's father, and he was in the front row in the middle. And I said, I was talking about, you know, I don't know how I set it up, but I was like, hey, and, and you, sir, you have golden magical sperm. And, <laughs> and, and people started clapping and laughing, but he didn't hear what I said. So after the, the clapping kind of stopped and people noticed that he was kind of talking to, to his sister next to him, like, what did he say? And then it got quiet in the room and she leaned over and said, what I said, you have gold. He said that you have golden magical sperm. And then he was like, oh, 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 yeah, I do. I do. And he started <laughs> waving and then everybody started clapping and laughing. And I was like, oh, yes. You know, because there was no laughing at, until that point. It was the only laugh, big laugh like that. So then afterwards, Chad from Nickelback comes up to me right after we were done and we go back to this little room where the family is. He was like, man, what a great speech you wrote. 
And I said, dude, I, I made all that shit up right there and then, dude. And he said, how? So I, I doing that in front of everybody and being such a, a, a lover and a, and, a, and, a, and a volunteer supporter of the Abbott brothers, uh, I get a call in September of 2020, uh, right after we bought this house. Uh, and so if you know what that's like, you have zero in your bank account. Uh, because houses are really expensive, especially over here. So I get a call from the state saying that, uh, you know that limo that Vinny had? And I was like, of course, I partied in it a bunch. Uh, what's up? And they were like, we want to give it to you. The estate of Vinny Paul wants you to own it. And I was like, does it run? I'm like, what does it look, what is, is it in, what condition is it in? And he was like, ooh. Uh, let me send you a video and a picture. And it was so rotted. It became one with the earth. It oh. was neglected for years. Vinny wanted to fix it, but he got a quote that was $90,000 to fix it. A 97 Lincoln stretched limo. And Vinny was like, no way. It's way too fucking much. So he just left it rotty for years. And then he passed away. And then years later, I get this call. I say, of course, I'll take it. Not thinking, really knowing what I was getting myself into. Uh, I had to go pick it up in Vegas um, and bring it on a, on a flat, drag it onto the back of a flatbed because it wasn't running the tire. It was like you couldn't drive it, right? Yeah. No, nothing. So when um, I brought it over to Long Beach as a rusted, uh, historic piece of shit, really, it would have cost them money to get rid of it. And they just gave it to me because it didn't cost anything, you know? Right. Because it was that bad shape. So I get this thing. I spend uh, months and months and thousands and thousands of dollars trying just to get it running again, you know, uh, replacing a lot of stuff that was rusted and wasn't even working and you couldn't put gas in this thing. You know, it was just really bad. I got it running and then, I, then now what? You know, and I was trying to, to see what I can do with it. And, and then my friend, uh, came up with this awesome idea to do uh, my friend Sonny. He was like, dude, because I was stressing out on how am I going to pay for this? This is crazy. This is already costing me so much money. Like what? Dude, what am I? I was freaking out. And then my friend was like, dude, you need help. You need to ask the fans for help. And I said, dude, I don't know, man. Like I've never asked for anything. I've never asked for help before. And he was like, you have to, you can't do this by yourself, man. What is he going to do? So let it sit there forever. You know, people expect you to do something with it. And, and, and so we came, you know, we came up with the GoFundMe idea. And everybody that donated anything got their name engraved um, on the inside of the back bar panel. Like the whole back bar is 893 names. After about a week, we raised about 33000 And, you know, months later, it, it went up to fifty, And when I was trying to go around to different body shops in uh, the area, everybody was rejecting me. Nobody wanted to work on it. They said it was, it's too much money. It's too much time. You don't have enough money and we don't have the time to fix this. You know, people wouldn't even call me back after seeing uh, the limo. It was be, it was getting to the point of like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. It's, yeah. it's, it's, this is so expensive. Like I can't even with the money that I raised fix this. I met the guy who originally stretched the limo back in the end of the 90s. It's a 97 Lincoln stretch, but it's, it's stretched longer than normal. And, it, and, and, and at the time, there was a famous place in Corona, California, about an hour from here, that would customize limos and sell them to different parts of the country. Well, a guy that worked in the shop at that time, customizing this specific limo, because they had uh, limo brand names, and, and you knew what, what company stretched it and it had the badges on, on the limo. And so this guy who I happened to get the hold of was like, I worked in a shop that did this original stretch. Come in, let's talk. And I was like, oh my God. And when I met him, he was such a great person. He wanted to help me, but he's like, dude, this is going to cost so much money. You have to redo this whole thing. Like it's, you can't, the, the, the support, like everything, you have to start, you have to, gut the, everything and start it over and yeah. build a new limo. And he was like, you just buy a used one, pimp that out and, and call it a day. And I said, dude, Enrique, I can't do that. This is a specific limousine from this famous pair of brothers. 
and I, I have to fix this. You know, I can't do that idea. And, and he was like, oh, say, it'll cost so much money. And I was begging him, Sydney. I saw a little glimmer of hope and I was begging him, please, Enrique, you're my only hope, dude. You're the only yeah. person that can do this. And he agreed to do it for $50,000. He said, it's a $100,000 project, but I'll do it for 50 because I want to help you. And I love this story. I, I want to be a part of this. This is a good thing for, for, for you know, my heart. And I was like, oh, my God. I'm, I'm, I'm an emotional guy. I, was, I, was, I had tears, but I was trying to be cool. And um, then the, it was in the shop for seven months. And he gutted it and completely everything is brand. I mean, so much and all the inside of the back is all brand new. Uh, we reused a lot of the original pieces, the doors, the windows, the front, the back, the, 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 the wheels. Um, we, re, we just re-chrome them. So, every, so a lot of stuff is original, but, but, but the electrical, uh, AC heating, the stereo system, which is so crazy. Like everything is brand new and custom and it's got a beautiful tribute to Vinnie Paul and Dimebag in the back. I have uh, Vinnie's uh, original license plate inside the limo. I have his Dallas Cowboys bottle opener from his kitchen in Vegas inside of the limo. Uh, that's where we open our modelos. And yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a gorgeous, gorgeous um, memorabilia. I cannot believe that I have this. I talk about Vinny and Dime so much to strangers uh, on podcasts with you here. Uh, everywhere I go, people ask me about this limousine. So I'm talking about Vinny and Dime more than I've ever talked about them in my life. They've given me beautiful signs of, of gratitude and thanks uh, since I've done this. Um, I feel like they watch over me. I'm not even kidding. Um, they, I feel like that limo has so much positive love and energy. I spent so much money, so much time, so much energy and effort into rebuilding this. It's no one would ever know that. I mean, only like me and my family. Like I, I spent, people don't even know how long this took and how much time this took away. I didn't do work. I didn't do shit because I was handling this. It, it's still so stressful. Uh, Chris Jericho paid for a year of me to park it indoors because it tried to get broken into in a lot that I had it after I got it fixed. And I was like, no fucking way. And then it's expensive to park a big ass 29 foot yeah. limo in Orange County, California. It's really expensive. Indoor parking is really expensive because it's like the size of an RV. Right. So I found this place that were big Pantera fans. They gave me an awesome discount. They charged me three, three, three a month, which is uh, Diamond Vinny's favorite number. And I had that tattooed on my hand. And so they agreed to, to charge me that much. And Chris Jericho loved the story that he sent me a check for a year's worth of parking for that limo. And I couldn't believe it. He was the biggest donor of the limousine. So thank you, Jericho. But just because I was on this podcast talking about it and he heard that story, and he was like, dude. So it, it, I've been so blessed for everybody to help me restore this, but this is a limo of the people. Like I did a, a cool thing in Vegas um, last month where I just parked it somewhere on a sa Sunday afternoon and I gave out free uh, black tooth and I had whiskey shots for anybody that wanted to come inside the limo and take pictures and go inside and do video and do shots, smoke weed with me, whatever. So I'm gonna, you know, just do things where they can go inside. I've parked, I went to, I drove it to Aftershock I had so many band members and, and, and VIPs in it. I had fans in the limos. I don't even know these people. And they would just come, they would, I would invite them in. Just like Vinny and Dime would do. Yeah. You know, we, I would give them drinks, give them shots, give them whatever they want. Like that's what, this, so the vehicle is a symbol of what those guys represented on earth and how they treated people. And, you know, I want to use this vehicle uh, in a lot of cool ways. Uh, but really to raise money for a charity that I'm starting that I, I already have um, up. I'm just waiting to get my, uh, my last clearance from the government to be a 501c3. And I'm only a week away from that. So I've been working years on starting a charity. And so I thought that using this limo 
for people that want to rent it to go to shows in the area, use it for whatever personal reasons. Well, you know, if they want me in it or out of it, doesn't matter, you know, it'll be uh, whatever, but the, the, that money will be how I can raise money for my charity called Headbang for Science. So um, I, I, I want to give back, I want to use it for good, but it already represents something very beautiful. And I can't believe that I have that. That is insane. It's it's incredible that you know they stay just so relevant and you know the love you know even after you know you know they've passed away you know it's it's, it's so strong like it's it's stronger than ever and I love that I I had no idea that um you did that where people you know could come and hang out that's so cool like it's fucking Vinnie Paul's low. I want to do that everywhere I can and yeah. you know even maybe take it to Daytona when we go to welcome the Rockville in May and uh, the president of the track out there i met him in november when we were out there and he said well, why don't you bring the limo and we do charity runs on the on the daytona 500 on the track and people can run ride in the limo for yeah. charity around the track and i was like oh my god That's what a sick. great idea <laughs> so yeah but sydney just real quick the head bank for science is a scholarship award where i'm going to award a graduating high school senior who has financial need excellent grades majoring in science or medicine and loves heavy metal. Headbang for science. My first award is gonna be given this spring. Uh, sorry, not this spring, next spring in 2023. And I'd like, I mean, right now the plan is to give $10,666. So um, to one graduating high school senior and, and, and start a group of, of, of an alumni and help students and help metal nerds and people like, like me that we need the help. And there's, there's no such thing as a heavy metal scholarship award. Now there is. And so I'm the first to have it. I'm very proud. I have an awesome board of directors. Lizzie Hale from Hailstorm is on my board of directors. Uh, she's a dear friend of mine. And I have Danny Wimmer on there as well, who's the biggest rock festival promoter in the country. Uh, I have some really cool people representing the medical and the rock industry that are on my board of directors. And um, I have my bylaws, my articles of incorporation. I'm already started in California. It's so much work. The limo was one thing. After I got the limo done, then I was like, what else can I spend so much money and time on, you know, that's gonna just take me away from everything. Uh -huh. Why don't you start a charity? So, uh, but this is an idea that I came up with in a dream in 2014. And I woke up the next day and I went to LegalZoom and I started my charity in Jersey, but then I moved it to California and I've done everything now since and um, just getting my 501c3 status, which means if somebody gives me money, uh, then they can get a, a tax write off for their taxes. And so and that gives me a code that I'll be uh, recognized and I'm already a recognized public charity, which is, yeah, it, it's just so much work. and I'm doing this all by myself. Yeah. It's, it, it's like, but it's one of these things where I, I feel so strongly about it and I'm going to, the karma points that I'm going to get into my karma bank account is huge. And, and that's what I want. I, I really want to help and I want to make this a, a big deal and um, I'm going to talk about it so much. So we're working on the website now. So it's, it's up, but it's not, you know, I'm, I'm, I haven't really made it public just yet so yeah. uh, i'm waiting for a, a few more things so yeah so so there you go sydney uh something else that i'm trying to do to give back to our community no that's cool there's a lot of you know scholarships that are you know music related but not a lot you know, not one that i've heard of that's you know not like you know, if you made it's free if you major in music or something like that but it's cool that like it's not a music major it's for a music lover you know, that you don't necessarily have to be majoring, um, you know, in bi you know, business or theory or, you know, any kind of instrument. That's really cool. I've never heard of anything like that before. It's, uh, it's, it's a bulletproof, beautiful thing that I, I cannot wait to really promote and to launch. And I really know for a fact that I can encourage students to do well in school. Sometimes they just need that little extra thing to be like oh dude i love jose i'm gonna win that so that i can do you know i'm gonna try to win that so people that apply 
you, you have to have a, a, a high grade point average. Like you have to, it's not just for people that are just like, okay, students, this is for nerds. So like, that's, what's so cool about it. Like, even if they don't get the award, applying for it is my reward because then, then they work so hard to get to that point. Right. So it's really a really cool thing because I know how many doctors, scientists are massive fans of heavy metal music but there's never been a combination of the two things as a financial award. And I want to make it substantial and I want to make these people famous too. Like when I get, when I, my first winner, you, I'm, that person's going to be like a friend of mine, you know, like forever. You're the first person that would receive this scholarship award. that's going to go on well beyond my lifetime. Yeah. You know, this is something that's going to be forever and I want it to be forever. And so to start that alumni and then to have students see that and how much love and praise that I give that student on the radio, on social media, you know, having taco dinners with me and, and tequila with me and my family. Like that's yeah. people are going to want to win that. And so to me, that's it. I win. I win because they're going to try. And that means everything. And that's all you need to do is try. Because remember what I said in the beginning, it's not about that degree so much as it, the, the, the journey to it. So if I can encourage some big metalhead to go to a four-year university to major in, uh, to be a, a chemistry major and to go to be, far, to be a pharmacist, like, oh my God. And their favorite band's Pantera, oh my God. Like, it's going to be hard for me not to give it to that person. So, yeah. you know, but yeah. So, and I'll tell if they're a metalhead. People ask me, well, how are you going to know if they're metalheads? Well, I'm going to do a video submission and an essay. So, and I can tell, we talked about it earlier, you can tell fake from real. So when I'm seeing somebody on video, you know, uh, presenting me, you know, wh why they're metal and what metal means to them and yeah. the scholarship award. And I can tell, you know, if somebody just says, oh, I, I love five finger death punch and, uh, and, and, th and, th and third eye blind, or I don't know, like, yeah, <laughs> it, it has to be genuine. I mean, five yeah. fingers great. But it, but it has to be more than just like, you know, this is just this one thing. Because if they're going to go for the main, most popular band, then I'm going to be a little suspect. Yeah. So it's going to be cool to, to look at these submissions and to really be able to be like, okay, that's my person right there. That's going to be someone that represents the Headbang for Science alumni, the organization. You know, someone that I feel like is going to really complete this and finish this, you know, and be a doctor from it. So that's so cool. And, it's the, that's the thing that gets me most excited is Headbank for Science. I have an awesome logo. You know, I've worked so hard on this, Sydney. So uh, it's, 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 it's taken, today's 2022, uh, 2014. So it's been, it's been wow. a bunch of years. Almost a decade. That's crazy. Yeah, but I stopped working on it because I moved to California and then other stuff came up and then it wasn't a priority. And my old manager was like, that's not, a, that's not something you want to do now. You would do that later when you're older. And it's like, but no person like this. I want to do this now. The time is now. But my old, yeah, my old manager was like, no, I'll do that later. Let's, let's make money right now. But he's not my manager anymore. I have an awesome new manager. <laughs> and who, when I first told him about this idea, he was like, that's amazing. Because that's, that's the launch pad for everything that I do. You know, if, if so, you know, whatever, any festival that I host, I, I'd love to, to raise any event that I do, I'm going to do a big launch party in April and Spirit Box is going to play. So, you know, like I, I, like I want to do, I want to make a lot of noise with this. And I think this can be a really cool thing for the community. No, this is really cool. I'm excited for that. I'll definitely, uh, when it goes live and everything, definitely share it. You know, um, I'm not, not sure. I don't know too too many uh, high school seniors myself right now, but um, I will I will definitely share it around. That's that's really cool. I uh, I love shit like that. That's you know, like you said, it's it's college. You know, even with college being so expensive, and it's just you know that you know in and of itself is such a hurdle that people have, and you know to even have a little bit of a push, you know, and have another opportunity where people you know may have not gone just because of finances, you know, if they can have a little bit of help, you know, that's, that's amazing. So that's really cool. Yeah. And again, it's just the motivating to yeah. do it. Yeah. Like you have to be a badass to apply. Right. So be a badass and then apply. <laughs> so um, I, I think that, that, that's going to, that to me is going to move the needle the most. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Jose, for coming on. This was so great. I am, you know, I'm so happy to to have you in, on here and to talk to you. You know, like I said, we kind of started out uh, off camera, you know, but I'm, you know, starting my journey as a DJ and, you know, to be able to, you know, talk to people like you and, you know, other DJs on other rock stations, you know, whether it's satellite or, you know, FM, it's really cool, you know, to just see people who have done it and have succeeded and have, you know, done great things with it. So no, this is really cool. Thank you so much for coming on and doing this. You're welcome, Sydney. And this is not the uh, last time that we'll be hanging stuff. So I'm looking forward to hearing your shows and uh, you know, who knows what the future holds, but, but I'm very uh, happy to be able to do this with you and uh, to encourage you with your hosting and presenting stuff. So I hope some of the stuff that we said, you know, helps you become even more of a badass. Thank you so much. It definitely will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you can check out Jose on all of his social media. He's on Twitter, Instagram, um, of course, on all the Sirius XM socials and, you know, websites and everything. Um, he is on, again, Sirius Liquid Metal and Octane. So you can check out uh, all those channels and hang out with him there. Um, and yeah, he's going to be hosting some festivals as well this year. The return of live music. Fingers crossed everything goes on as planned. But uh, yeah, no, this was so cool. Thank you. You're welcome. I look forward to hanging with you in real life too, Sydney. So hell yeah.